A crown of swords begins with Elida. She is reading a message she received saying that Randall Thor has been captured and is being brought to the White Tower. Elida's plan is to keep Rand in the White Tower and control him until he has to fight the Dark One at the last battle. She has also received reports saying that Rand and Masrim Taim have been gathering a large force of male channelers at the Black Tower, but Elida does not believe they could have gathered that many male channelers, so she decides to only send 50 Aes Sedai to confront the Ashaman. Elida's Keeper of the Chronicles, Alviaren, also informs Elida that the rebel Aes Sedai have chosen Ewain Alvir as their armorland seat and that they're marching towards Tarvalin with Gareth Bryn's army. Afterwards, Alviaren goes back to her room and she finds the forsaken Masana waiting for her. Alviaren is Black Aja and she reports to Masana. After Alviaren tells her what she told Elida, Messana shows her how to make a gateway but tells her not to show anyone or use it without permission. Later, an Aes Sedai that survived the Battle of Dumai's Wells arrives and tells Elida that the mission to kidnap Rand went completely wrong. She says that the Aeol and hundreds of Ashaman arrived and defeated them. Elida is horrified by the news and Alviaren points out the fact that there were hundreds of Ashaman at the battle and Elida only sent 50 Aes Sedai to deal with them and now it's too late to warn them about the size of the Black Tower. Alviaren tells Elida that if she doesn't do what she tells her, she will have the same fate as Swan Sanchez before her. Elida is now desperate and decides to do whatever Alviaren tells her to do. After the Battle of Dumai's Wells, Savannah and the Shadow go on the run and they stop to rest at Kingslayer's Dagger. Samael has been working with them, but they don't know his true identity. He tells Savannah that Rand's forces know where they are and they're currently on their way to finish them off. He gives Savannah an oath rod, which is used to make any female channeler obey and then he makes gateways for the Shido that all lead to different places, but the Shido don't know this. Some of the Shido appear close to Rand's forces and they're immediately decimated. We then see Pedro Nile playing stones with Morghese Trakant. His spymaster, Omerna, arrives and gives him a message that says that the rumors of the White Tower split are true. As he is reading the message, he is killed by Omerna who is then immediately killed by Aemon Balda. Aemon Balda and Rada Masunawa have been plotting against Pedro Nile and they turned Omerna against him. Balda becomes the new Lord Commander of the Children of the Light and he makes Morghese renounce all of her titles. He also abuses Morghese by taking her to his bed and after a while Morghese begins to give up on life. One day, her bodyguards, Talambor and Basil Gill arrive to inform Morghese that they saw people riding a giant bird and Morghese doesn't believe them, but then a battle begins and the one power is used during it. After the battle, some men with strange armor arrive and they take Morghese to speak to a woman by the name of High Lady Suroth. Lady Suroth knows who Morghese is and she tells Morghese that they are the Sunshine Empire and after she explains who the Sanchan Empire is, she tells Morghese that they have already taken over Terebon and now Amadisia, and that if she still wants to be the Queen of Andor after they take over all of the nations, she has to swear fealty to the Sanchan Empire. Morghese goes back to her room and she thinks about her options. She doesn't want to be the puppet of the Sanchan, so she renounces the throne of Andor and tries to commit suicide so that Elaine can be the next queen of Andor, but her nurse Lini manages to stop her and changes her mind. Then her bodyguards arrive with a man named Balwer who used to be the secretary to Pedro Nile. He tells her that he can get them out of the city and away from the Sunchan and they all agree to go with him. Bauer manages to safely take Morghese and her group out of the city. Iwen Alvir and the rebel Aes Sedai are marching towards Tarvalin with Gareth Bryn's army. On the way, Iwen realizes that there's some Aes Sedai missing and she's told by Shiriam that they went to the White Tower to spread the tale that the Red Aja set Logan up as a false dragon. 
Suddenly, Ewain feels pain through the Adam that she shares with the forsaken Mugirian, and she immediately goes to check on her, but Mugirian is nowhere to be found. Ewain knows that a man channeled to set Mugirian free and worries that it might have been Logan, but she thinks that it's more likely that a male forsaken came and rescued Mugirian. Then Ewain goes to Telaranriad and she speaks to the Wise Ones and tells them that she is now the Revel Aes Sedai's Amorin seat and that she knows that they most likely did this because the Revel Aes Sedai think that they can control her. Ewain notices that the Wise Ones are hiding something from her but she doesn't say anything. Back in the real world, Ewain speaks to Gareth Bren and he tells her that more and more men have been arriving to join his army and that the band of the Red Hand, which is temporarily being led by Lord Talmonis, has also been growing in size. Matt Cawthon went to Evudar and he told Talmonis to follow the Revel Aes Sedai wherever they go. Matt and the Vand have the reputation of never losing a battle and because of this, the Vand has been growing a lot. Gareth Brynn also informs Ewain that a rumor of Rand swearing fealty to Elida and the White Tower has been spreading. This makes Ewain laugh hysterically and she tells him that that will never happen. Back in the camp, Ewain learns that an Aes Sedai named Mirel has Land Mondragoran as a warder. Ewain knows that Mirel made Lan her water without his consent, which is a very serious crime. But if this wasn't done, Lan would have probably died after his bond with Moraine broke. Ewain also knows that Lan and Nynaeve are in love, so she decides to give Lan a new purpose in life, and she sends him to Ebudar to keep Nynaeve safe. In Ebudar, Nynaeve, Elaine, and Avienda are still searching for the Ball of the Wind, but so far they haven't found it. Avienda suggests asking Matt for help since he is Tevirin, but Nynaeve refuses for some reason. Eventually, Nynaeve accepts and sends Virgitta to tell Matt to help them search for the Terangriel. They then go to speak to the Sea Folk about helping them use the Ball of the Wind once they find it. They know that in order to use the Bowl of the Winds, they need a circle of at least 13 channelers. And since they know that some of the Sea Folk can channel, they go to ask for their help. The Sea Folk know what the Bowl of the Winds is and say that they have been looking for it for a long time. But before they agree to help, they say that a deal needs to be made about the use of the Terangriel. So the two groups begin to work on the terms. Matt is very frustrated with Elaine and Nynaeve because they keep on leaving without him to search for the Ball of the Winds. On the street, he spots a woman that he recognizes from somewhere. Then he remembers that the woman is a dark friend that tried to kill Rand and him when they were heading to Camelin in Book 1. Matt follows the woman to a house that according to an old man belongs to Jake and Carradine, a White Cloak ambassador. Jake and Carradine also known as the man that calls himself Bowers, is a white cloak but also a dark friend. Samael appears to him and reminds him of his mission to find the stash of hidden Terangriel in the city. Keratin tells him that his quest has become difficult because there's Aes Sedai in the city. Samael decides to help Keratin with this issue and says that he will send someone to deal with the Aes Sedai. Matt goes to the Queen's Palace to warn Elaine and Nynaeve about Jake and Keratin, but he doesn't find them. He meets Queen Tylin and he tells her about Keratin, but she quickly changes the subject and she tries to seduce him. The next day, Birgitta goes to speak to Matt about helping them find the Ball of the Winds. Matt recognizes her as one of the heroes of the Horn that he summoned after he blew the Horn of Valir at the Battle of Falma in Book 2. After the two speak for some time, they decide to go out drinking. The two become good friends and when Brigitte returns to Nynaeve and Elaine, she tells them that Matt will only help them if they apologize to him for the way they treated him at the end of Book 3 when he rescued them from the Stone of Tear. According to Matt, they didn't even say thank you and Elaine realizes that it's true, so she agrees to apologize to him, but Nynaeve cannot bring herself to do it, but eventually she agrees. The next day, they go to the inn where Matt is staying and they apologize to him. Matt accepts their apology and agrees to help them find the Ball of the Winds. 
As the girls are leaving, the innkeeper stops them and tells them that she doesn't believe that their Aes Sedai and that they could get in big trouble if the real Aes Sedai ever found out. Satel tells them that she can take them to a place where they can be helped with this issue and they decide to let the innkeeper believe what she wants because she might actually take them to where the Ball of the Winds is located. The innkeeper takes them to a place called the Kin where they find multiple women that can channel. Elaine and Nynaeve tell them that they are Aes Sedai but the women of the Kin don't believe them and they decide to kick them out. Elaine returns to the palace and finds out from the rebel Aes Sedai staying there that the White Tower has always known about the kin but they keep it a secret. The tower sees the kin as a good thing because they take up women that have failed to become Aes Sedai or have ran away from the tower for different reasons. With this information, Elaine and the rebel Aes Sedai go back to the kin and after the kin finally accept her as an Aes Sedai, she tells them that the White Tower knows about them. This shocks the kin and they're scared that this may mean an end to them but Elaine tells them that they will be allowed to become Aes Sedai which makes them very happy. Elaine finds out that there's about 2000 members of the kin and one of them is over 400 years old. When she asks them if they know where the Ball of the Winds might be, they say that they know of a secret stash of Terangriel which might contain the crystal ball. Meanwhile, Nynaeve is on her way to speak to the Athanir when suddenly Mogidian appears and destroys the boat she is in. Nynaeve sinks and gets trapped in the boat. She is unable to breathe and after struggling for air, she gives up and completely surrenders because she thinks she's going to die. When she does this, her block is broken and now she is able to channel whenever she wants. She is then saved by Lan, who arrives just in time and after saving her, he explains where he's been. Nynaeve tells him that they should get married and when they arrive with the sea folk, they get married in a sea folk ceremony. Afterwards, Elaine and the rebel Aes Sedai go with the kin to where they say the Ball of the Winds might be. They're joined by Lan, Nynaeve and Matt who is accompanied by some of his men from the Band of the Red Hand. Matt tells them that Queen Tylen has been forcing herself on him but the girls don't take him seriously. When they arrive at the location, they're attacked by a new kind of shadow spawn that is almost invincible. The creature is immune to the one power and is very fast and can also get into any space without any problem. The creature kills several of Matt's men and two of the kin but Matt manages to hold his own against it and when it touches Matt's medallion, the creature begins to scream. Matt figures out that his foxhead medallion is the only thing that can harm the shadow spawn so he starts to use the medallion as a weapon and he takes the creature to a room with no way out but the creature still manages to get away through a crack in the wall. After everyone recovers from the attack, Elaine finally finds the Ball of the Winds and they return to the palace where they are joined by the sea folk. Birgitta knows what the creature is and she tells Matt what she knows. Matt tells everyone that they need to leave immediately because the creature will return. He tells them what Birgitta told him, that the shadow spawn is a golem and it was created during the War of Power to kill Aes Sedai. It is immune to the one power and can sense when someone is channeling. It can also go through any cracks because it has no bones. After Matt finally convinces them to leave, the kin take the group to a farm outside of Ebudar. But Matt stays behind because Oliver has gone missing and Matt goes out into the city to look for him. When he arrives at the city, he finds it under siege by the Sanchan. Matt is attacked by a Soldam and her Domani and a wall falls down on him and now he is trapped in Ebudar. Finally we have Rand. In the aftermath of Dumai's Wells, Rand and Master and Taim argue over who should look after the Aes Sedai that have sworn fealty to him. Taim says that the Ashaman should be the ones that look after them but Rand decides to give the Aes Sedai over to the wise ones. Taim accepts Rand's decision and he tells Rand that he should at least have one Ashaman as a guard. Rand accepts and he randomly chooses an Ashaman named Dashiva. Dashiva makes a gateway to Kyrian and they all return to the city. In Kyrian, they learn that a noble by the name of Kolaver has been crowned the Queen of Kyrian. 
When Rand goes to the palace, he finds Colliver sitting in the throne, and she refuses to give it up. But after Fael reveals that Colliver was planning on breaking her oath of fealty to Rand, she is sentenced to death. But Rand cannot bring himself to see another woman die because of him especially after so many of the maidens died for him in Dumai's wells. So he decides to instead strip Colliver of all of her titles and lands and exiles her to a farm where she will live the rest of her life as a commoner. Afterwards, Rand goes to speak with the clan chiefs and they discuss what to do with the Shido that survived Dumai's wells. They are interrupted by Berlane who is angry with Rand because he has decided to send her away to Mayen after she was attacked by an assassin. Rand doesn't think she is safe in Kyrian, but Berlin disagrees and she refuses to leave. Suddenly, an Aes Sedai by the name of Katswain arrives. Katswain is a legendary Aes Sedai that many believe dead. She speaks to Rand as an equal and shows no fear towards him. Katswain asks Rand if he has begun to hear voices, which makes him very angry because he has been hearing the voice of Louis Theron Telemann. After Katswain leaves, he is informed that the philosopher Herod Fell was found dead. Men then arrives to tell Rand more bad news, but first Rand informs her that Herod Fell was found dead and says that he thinks it was probably a shadow spawn that killed him, but he doesn't know why. Then Min informs him that Culliver was also found dead, but that she committed suicide by hanging. Rand now feels responsible for the death of another woman, and Min is very sad about the death of Herod Fell because he was a close friend of hers. The two embrace each other, and then they have sex. Afterwards, Rand and Perrin get into a very heated argument, and Rand uses the one power on Perrin and then orders him to leave the city immediately. This turns out to be a fake argument and is just a ploy for Perrin, his group and Berlin to leave Kyrian without anyone suspecting a thing. Rand has given Perrin a secret mission. He is to go to Gildon and find Masima who calls himself the prophet of the dragon and bring him and his forces back to Rand. Min goes to see Rand and he apologizes to her because he thinks that he forced himself on her when they had sex. Rand is currently in a bad state of mind and he doesn't think that Min would want to be with him, so she tells him that she loves him and that she wants to be with him. Rand then decides to go deal with the sea folk that have been waiting to speak to him for some time. He takes some Aes Sedai with him and he tells the sea folk that he is the dragon reborn and therefore their Koromor. He wants them to serve him but the sea folk want to negotiate a deal first. Rand agrees and the negotiations go very well for him because he is the most powerful Tiberian ever and the sea folk feel the Tiberian effect and they start agreeing to Rand's terms. Rand wants them to transport men and supplies to his allies and also keep a close eye on the ocean because he knows that the Sun Chan will return at some point. After a while, Rand starts to feel claustrophobic and tells the Aes Sedai to finish the negotiations for him. Rand has been feeling claustrophobic ever since he was kidnapped and kept in a box by the White Tower Aes Sedai in the last book. He decides to go see the Korean rebels that have been staying outside the city and when he arrives at the rebel camp, he finds Katswain and other Aes Sedai in attendance. After he speaks with some of the Korean nobles, one of them challenges him to a duel and Rand accepts. As Rand and the men fight, a mysterious fog appears around the camp and an Aes Sedai is snatched away by something. Rand and the remaining Aes Sedai begin to retreat and as they're doing so, Rand sees a woman being attacked by something and he uses Bellfire to save her. Katsuin is outraged that he used Bellfire and the two begin to argue. Pat and Fane appears out of nowhere and he stabs Rand with the Shadow Logo dagger and then he gets away. Rand is unconscious and the Aes Sedai take him back to the palace and they try to heal him, but they can't. An Ashaman that specializes in healing arrives and he notices that Rand was stabbed in the same exact spot where he got stabbed by Ishamael in Book 2. He says that the two wounds are two different types of evil but he manages to separate them from Rand 
and the two evils begin to fight each other. The Aes Sedai are so impressed by the Ashaman's healing that they beg him to show them what he did. After two days, Rand wakes up and Min tells him of a new viewing she's had. Catswain is going to teach him and the Ashaman something that they won't like. He then decides to finally put his plan into action and goes after Samael. Rand and his forces travel to Ilion and after they arrive, Samael travels to Shadar Logos and Rand follows him. In Shadar Logos, he finds Trollocs everywhere and he also comes across Leah, who is the maiden with the spear that disappeared in Shadar Logos in the last book. Rand tries to help Leah, but as soon as she recognizes him, she runs away. With Rand distracted with Leah, Samael channels lightning at him and Rand almost falls into a trap, but he is saved by a mysterious man in black. Then Mashadar appears and Rand attacks it with Bellfire. The mysterious man does the same thing and their Bellfire streams become one. When this happens, Rand starts seeing double and he becomes disoriented for a moment, but they're able to drive Mashadar away. The mysterious man tells Rand where Samael might be hiding and then he leaves. When Rand finds Samael, he sees that he's about to be attacked by Mashadar and just as he's about to bellfire him, he sees Leah about to be consumed by the black wind. So he bellfires her instead because he doesn't want her to suffer at the hands of Mashadar. He then notices that Samael is nowhere to be seen and since he never felt him channel to escape, he assumes that he was killed by the black wind. Mashadar then starts consuming all of the Trollocs and Rand returns to Ilion. In Ilion, Rand finds the Council of Ilion waiting for him. They say that they don't want to fight and he is given the crown of swords. Rand accepts it and he becomes the new king of Ilion.